Baker to welcome Dr. Anthony Grace to Vanderbilt to give today's Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Dr. Grace is currently Distinguished Professor of Neuroscience and Professor of Psychiatry and Psychology at the University of Pittsburgh. He is a Western Pennsylvania native and attended Allegheny College, followed by a PhD in the Department of Pharmacology at Yale uh, with Dr. Steve Bunny, where he conducted truly fundamental work on the activity of nigral dopamine neurons in vivo. So by my count, he published over 30 scientific articles with Dr. Bunny, with almost 20 of them having only two authors. I'm also told by Dr. Deutsch that Tony earned the nickname Amazing Grace for not only his productivity, uh, but also his technical abilities, including being the first person to ever record midbrain dopamine neurons in vivo. I'm also told that he did uh, much of this in the overnight hours to avoid vibration artifacts that uh, uh, made those recordings difficult during the day. So from there, he went to NYU, where he was a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Rodolfo Linas, and then started his own lab at Pitt as an assistant professor in 1985. He's been there ever since, has published over 350 papers, and was appointed as a distinguished professor at Pitt in 2010, one of the university's highest faculty honors. So in thinking about this introduction, what kept coming to my mind was the game show Family Feud, where people are asked a question and the number of points scored is based on how many people surveyed responded with that answer. In an alternative universe where neuroscience family feud is a thing and people were asked to name a scientist who has contributed massively to our understanding of neural circuits and health and psychiatric disease, I really think Tony would be without a doubt the top answer. He has made fundamental contributions to understanding how dopaminergic systems are regulated and how they can go awry, including how hippocampal hyperactivity can dysregulate dopamine neurotransmission, which is of great interest to many researchers in the department here. Tony's lab over the years has tackled, at least in my mind, what I think are the truly hard problems in psychiatric neuroscience, namely how developmental experience contributes to vulnerability to psychiatric disorders. The importance of this is really second nature for clinicians seeing patients, but uh, it's oftentimes less well represented in many basic scientific rodent models. So his work not only is greatly relevant for understanding disease pathophysiology and for treating disease, but perhaps even more importantly for understanding how to prevent the emergence of disease in the first place. So the last thing I wanted to mention is Tony's remarkable contribution to the field of neuroscience through his mentorship. Many of his trainees have gone on to themselves become leaders in neurobiology, enabling him to truly compound the impact he has had on the field. And Tony has also been very helpful for me personally in developing some of the research directions of my lab as well. In fact, the first time I reached out to Tony by email, I thought that I had received an out of the office auto reply due to the speed of his response, but in fact received an enthusiastic and very encouraging invitation to discuss my ideas with him. So with that, I'd really like to thank Dr. Grace for being here today virtually. Uh, and I will turn it over to him for his lecture entitled Early Life Stress and Susceptibility to Schizophrenia and Depression. Thank you so much for that, uh, that great introduction. Uh, I assume you can hear me, correct? Um, so from, uh, that was a great introduction. I would just like to say from, uh, from your mouth to the study section here, uh, what I'm going to be talking about are some of the things we've been doing, looking at animal models related to major psychiatric disorders, especially schizophrenia and depression. Now, of course, we can't replicate these uniquely human disorders um, in an animal model. But what we can do is to go from imaging data, post-mortem data, and try to understand some of the components of the circuitry that's disrupted in humans. And if we disrupt these in animals, how this can impact the different circuitries that lead to symptom uh, provocation. So these are the learning objectives, talking about the impact of stress on developing systems uh, and how it contributes to pathophysiology, the role of parvobumin interneurons, uh, interneuron loss in the etiology of schizophrenia, how mitigating the effects of stress pre-puberty can prevent adult pathology and assessing how changes in different dopamine projection systems impact expression of schizophrenia and uh, depression. Now, this is a picture of the dopamine system in the rat. Here you have the ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra. Now, in the rat, we have this medial to lateral gradient. 
with the more most medial being related to affect or emotion, more lateral related to salience, and of course, substantia nigra related more to, to movement disorders. When you go from the rodent to the primate, the uh, differentiation remains, but the structure is different, where the VTA sort of crawls on top of the substantia nigra, and you have a dorsal and ventral tear in the substantia nigra. We know the dopamine system is involved in a number of disorders, including Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, drug abuse, and depression. How can we determine the overall activity state of these neurons in the brain of a living rat? Well, what we could do is record from an individual neuron. But what we found is that this really doesn't give us a complete picture of what's going on. First, we know that not all the neurons are firing spontaneously. Only about half are firing spontaneously, and the other half are held in a hyperpolarized and active state. And the ones that are firing are firing at different rates and patterns. So to get an assessment of what's coming out of the overall ventral tegmental area, what we do is pass an electrode through this area in an anesthetized rat in a preset pattern. And as we do this, we count the number of identified dopaminergic neurons that are firing spontaneously. And this gives us a measure of population activity. Then when we isolate them, we look at how fast they're firing and also their firing pattern. Now we look at these three parameters because we find that these are actually controlled by different circuits and have different behavioral impacts on the system. First, with respect to firing, we know that dopaminergic neurons have their spontaneous activity driven by a pacemaker conductance, not unlike the pacemaker conductance that keeps the heart beating. This is then broken up into an irregular pattern by usually GABAergic afferent inputs into this irregular pop, pop, pop type of pattern. But studies by Wolfram Schultz and others have shown when an animal is exposed to behaviorally salient stimulus, the dopaminergic neurons fire bursts of action potentials. So these bursts of action potentials are the behaviorally relevant or behaviorally salient output of the system. Burst firing alerts the brain that an important event has happened. So um, what regulates this uh, dopaminergic neuron activity? Well, what we find is that the firing neurons are driven by the pedunculopontine tegmentum, it releases glutamate that acts on NMDA receptors. And this changes them into a burst firing mode. Now, in order for NMDA to act, the neuron has to be depolarized. So if it's firing spontaneously, it's depolarized. This air pedunculopontine tegmentum can change spontaneous firing into burst firing. But if the neurons aren't active, there's a magnesium block of the NMDA channel, and you don't get a change in state. So again, only the active neurons can be can be caused to generate burst firing. Now this begs the question of what regulates whether a neuron is firing or not. Well, this seems to be very potently controlled by the ventral pallidum. The ventral pallidum is a GABAergic area that fires in very high frequencies and bombards these neurons with GABAergic inhibitory potentials. In fact, if you do in vivo intracellular recording from these neurons, you can hear this constant rumbling in the background from the high amplitude GABAergic IPS speeds. So this area holds subsets of neurons in a hyperpolarized non-firing state. If we inactivate the ventral pallidum, we remove this inhibition and the pacemaker conductance allows the population to start firing. Now what's the relevance of whether a neuron is firing or not? It provides a level of amplification of this burst firing signal. So again, the ventral pallidum controls whether a neuron is firing. The pedunculopontine causes firing neurons to burst fire. The pedunculopontine being the signal or the burst firing, but the ventral pallidum determining the gain or the amplification of that signal. And what we find is this system seems to play a major role in understanding the psychotic symptoms of schizophrenia and even the antidotic state of depression. Now, in order to study this, what we used is an animal model based on a developmental disruption. We know that there are a lot of risk factors for schizophrenia, and especially prenatally, we know that um, there's a strong genetic impact 
associated with schizophrenia. And we also know that there tends to be a hypermethylation state in the DNA of schizophrenia patients. So what we did is to use an animal model based on a mitotoxin, methylase oxymethanol acetate, or MAM. MAM is a DNA alkylating agent that delivers methyl groups to DNA. We find that if we give it a gestational day 17, we can recapitulate a number of things that you would see in schizophrenia in humans. Now we chose this because this is developmentally equivalent to the second trimester in humans that we know severe uh, interventions during the second trimester, such as severe influenza infections or famine, tend to increase the incidence of human schizophrenic births. So that's why we chose this day to give the alkylating agent. Now, uh, the MAM has a number of features that we see in common with the schizophrenia patient. We see <coughs> combinations with respect to the anatomy, especially thinning of the limbic cortical structures, which we see in the MAM animal and we see in schizophrenia patients. But along with the thinning is increased cell packing density. So we don't lose a lot of neurons, but we lose neuropil. But the neurons we do lose are the parvalbumin interneurons. These interneurons are lost in the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus of schizophrenia patients and in the MAM animal. We also see a lot of behavioral correlates. We see deficits in sensory gating, such as prepulse inhibition of startle. We see deficits in executive function, such as reversal learning and extra dimensional shift. And uh, negative symptoms of schizophrenia related to emotional regulation, such as latent inhibition or impaired social interaction. We also see pharmacological evidence. For example, we know from studies that were done back in the 50s before ethics were invented, if they gave a schizophrenia patient a drug like PCP, they could get a selective exacerbation of the schizophrenia. And it's the schizophrenia symptoms that that particular patient showed. And furthermore, while PCP can cause a psychotic light state in normals that can last for five to eight hours, in schizophrenia, it can last for weeks. We also see an increased locomotor response to amphetamine. We know amphetamine can cause a selective exacerbation of psychosis. But if we look at the prepubertal stage, before we have this hyperdopaminergic state, we don't see the difference in response to amphetamine. So this seems to track with psychosis itself. Now this increased amphetamine response is consistent with the role for dopamine in schizophrenia. And there's a lot of evidence for a role for dopamine in schizophrenia. For example, antipsychotic drugs we know are primarily dopaminergic antagonists. Drugs like amphetamine uh, and L-dopa we know can exacerbate, uh, the released dopamine can exacerbate the psychosis. And imaging studies show that there is an increased amphetamine-induced dopamine release in schizophrenia. Now this is done by looking at binding of a radioactive uh, dopamine blocker, raclopride, that binds to dopamine receptors with a low affinity. And it's a low affinity that can be displaced by endogenously released dopamine. So amphetamine releases dopamine, and the amplitude of the dopamine release correlates, or the amplitude of the raclopride displacement correlates with the amplitude of the increased dopamine release. And what you see in schizophrenia is a much higher dopamine release, and the amplitude of this increase, increase correlates with the ability of amphetamine to worsen psychosis. There's also an increase in fluoridopa uptake in the associated striatum, indicating that in the schizophrenia patient, especially in the psychotic state, there's an increased number of active dopaminergic terminals taking up the fluoridopa. Now, despite all this evidence, there's little evidence for a primary deficit in the dopamine system itself. Instead, we now believe the dopamine system itself is probably normal, but is likely to be dysregulated by other structures, in particular the hippocampus, which a number of studies have shown to be hyperactive in schizophrenia. Now, is the hippocampus hyperactive in the MAM model as we know it is in schizophrenia patients? Well, what we find if we just look at uh, activity in the hippocampus, and in this case, we're looking at the rodent and ventral hippocampus. We look at the ventral hippocampus in the rodent because this is the area that's connected to limbic structures such as the amygdala, nucleus accumbens, medial prefrontal cortex. 
that are involved in schizophrenia. This is functionally equivalent to the anterior hippocampus in humans, but it, the, uh, the hippocampus structure actually shifts as you go up the phylogenetic scale. So as you go up the phylogenetic scale, the hippocampus slides into the temporal lobe. So what was the ventral hippocampus in the rat is now the anterior hippocampus in the human. And what we find when we look at firing rate is these ventral hippocampal subicular neurons are firing much faster. But of course, the hippocampus is involved in things more than in, in um, oh, just reading a note, uh, more than just how fast they're firing. Their, their firing pattern also plays a big role. And what we find in the MAM animals is there's a dropout of the low frequency zero to four hertz rhythms that's invo involved in gating information flow in postsynaptic structures, and an increase in the higher frequency rhythms. So the normal gated output is replaced with a kind of high frequency noise, if you will, coming out of the system. Now, does this affect dopaminergic neuron activity? Well, when we look at our three parameters of dopaminergic neuron activity, how many cells are firing, how fast they're firing, and their firing pattern, what we find is that the uh, dopamine in the MAM rats, there's more than a doubling in the number of neurons firing. Essentially, every neuron is now active all the time without much of a change in average firing rate or firing pattern. Now, this increase in number of neurons firing is consistent with the clinical literature. Studies done in, in London by Howes and McGuire have shown that there's a big increase in fluoridopa uptake in ultra-high risk or schizophrenia patients that correlates with psychosis. Fluoridopa is taken up into active terminals. So they see more active terminals we see more dopaminergic neurons firing, driving those active terminals. So what we think is happening is that, again, the ventral pallidum is holding subsets of neurons in a hyperpolarized state. When the hippocampus is hyperactive, it overdrives the nucleus accumbens, which then inhibits the ventral pallidum and releases the dopaminergic neurons from this hyperpolarized state to cause a large number of them to start firing. We know that this is occurring because of the hippocampus, because if we inactivate the hippocampus with TTX, in normal rats, we don't get much of an effect. In the MAM rats, it brings firing back to normal without changing the other parameters. And if we look at behavior, as I mentioned, in the MAM rat, we tend to get a big increase in amphetamine-induced locomotion compared to the control. But if we inactivate the hippocampus and bring dopaminergic neuron firing back to normal, we also bring the behavioral response to amphetamine back to control levels. So therefore, hippocampal overdrive, we think, is leading to the increased dopaminergic neuron population activity that we think is the basis for the hyper-responsivity of the dopamine system in schizophrenia. Now, the ventral hippocampus is also involved in other things that we know are involved in schizophrenia, and one is context dependency. In other words, the ability to interpret stimuli depending on the context in which they're presented. So what we did is to use two different contexts. Context A, where the, we have a square pattern, a certain tone, a, uh, a, a red light, and an odor of acetic acid, in a second context that has a different shape, no tone, different color light, and different odor. We then expose them to foot shock in one context and nothing in the other context. And as you might expect, the animals, normal animals exposed to the punished context tend to show much more freezing or anxiety compared to the neutral context. MAM animals don't show a difference. And this is exactly what you see in schizophrenia patients where they're shown rooms, one associated with a negative experience and one neutral room, whereas the controls show much more feelings of anxiety in the punished context, schizophrenia patients don't show this difference. So these data show that in the MAM model of schizophrenia, ventral hippocampal hyperactivity leads to a hyper-responsive dopamine system that's proposed to underlie psychosis. Now, what causes the ventral hippocampus to be overactive in schizophrenia? Well, one of the most robust findings that's been reported in schizophrenia patients 
is a loss of a particular GABAergic inhibitory interneuron, those containing the peptide parvalbumin. These seem to be selectively lost in schizophrenia, both in the frontal cortex <coughs> and in the hippocampus. Now, what we find in our MAM model is the same thing, a reduction in parvalbumin-containing interneurons in the frontal cortex and the hippocampus without change in other areas of the brain. So this seems to be a regionally selective reduction in these interneuron numbers. Now, there are other areas that also show disruption in parvalbumin in schizophrenia patients. Specifically, Kim Doe and colleagues have shown that the thalamic reticular nucleus, that's a potent GABAergic area that surrounds the thalamus and is responsible for gating information in the thalamus, contains GABAergic neurons that are very strongly uh, parvalbumin positive. And what she found when you look at the anterior segment of the TRN, the parvalbumin neurons and the perineuronal nets surrounding the parvalbumin neurons are quite robust. But in the MAM model and in the schizophrenia patients, these are rather dramatically decreased. So what we see in the uh, thalamic reticular nucleus is an increase in the MAM animals in uh, oxidative stress and the loss of parvalbumin neurons and parvalbumin neurons protected by these uh, perineuronal nets. Now, in a normal animal, what we find is if we inactivate the infralimbic prefrontal cortex, an area that projects to the nucleus reticularis, what we find uh, uh, is that inactivating the infralimbic prefrontal cortex causes a big increase in the number of dopaminergic neurons firing. But interestingly, when we look at the MAM animals, where we already have an increase in dopaminergic neuron firing, inactivating the prelimbic prefrontal cortex causes the opposite effect, a decrease in the number of neurons firing. And this seems to be due to the state of this, um, these uh, thalamic reticular nucleus. Because if we give a uh, an antioxidant uh, like N-acetylcysteine, what we find is we can restore the normal um, increase in dopaminergic population activity uh, that we get in the control case. Now, why does this happen? Well, in the normal animal, the infralimbic prefrontal cortex controls the hippocampus through the nucleus reunions. And it does this through two pathways. One is a weak excitatory direct pathway, and the other is a very strong indirect inhibitory pathway. The inhibitory pathway predominates. But if we inactivate the infralimbic prefrontal cortex, what we do is we remove the drive of this inhibitory area, and now the direct pathway predominates, and we get an increase in population activity. But in the man animal, the TRN, is taken out of the picture, which means all we have is the direct excitation of the reunions and activation of population activity. Now, when we inactivate the infralimbic, we remove this excitatory drive, which then drops dopaminergic population activity. So this, these parvalbumin interneurons, when we lose them in the reticular nucleus, completely changes the sign of the frontal cortical hippocampal dopaminergic interaction. So therefore, in cases where the infralimbic cortex is hyperactive, the normal infralimbic attenuation of the re reunion's ventral hippocampal activity would be reversed to an activation, further exacerbating ventral hippocampal hyperactivity. Now, what I've been talking about is the ventral hippocampus and how it impacts the dopamine system, which we think is related to the psychosis. But the limbic hippocampus also has a number of other areas it projects to. One is it projects to the amygdala. And the amygdala, through its projections to the cingulate and orbital frontal cortex, are involved in emotional regulation, which could lead to negative symptoms. It also projects to the prefrontal cortex that's involved in cognitive dysfunction. So when the ventral hippocampus is hyperactive and dysrhythmic, it has the potential to pull down the entire circuit and to give us all of the different aspects 
of schizophrenia, positive symptoms, negative symptoms, and thought disorder. So the conclusion is that the evidence suggests that both in schizophrenia and the MAM model, there's hyperactivity in the ventral hippocampus, possibly due to decreased interneuron function. And if we inactivate the ventral hippocampus in the MAM model, we can re restore normal dopamine function. And what causes this loss of interneurons in the hippocampus? Well, one thing we found is that stress seems to play a big role. We know that stressful stimuli in pa schizophrenia patients will exacerbate the positive symptoms of the this disorder. And even patients that are well controlled on antipsychotic drugs will show an exacerbation of this state. We also know from evidence that stress may play a role in the etiology of schizophrenia. Specifically, Eve Johnstone did some epidemiological studies um, in children that were at genetic risk for schizophrenia, where she did a number of psychometric tests and then followed them to see who transitioned to schizophrenia and who didn't. And what she found are the children that showed hyper-responsivity to stressful stimuli tended to be the children that later transitioned to schizophrenia. And stress, we know, can cause a loss of parvalbumin interneurons in the hippocampus, which we think are the same neurons that are lost in patients with schizophrenia and in our MAM rats. So the premise is in normal individuals, the medial prefrontal cortex can limit the impact of stress exposure. But in disorders where the prefrontal cortical deficits may be present, these deficits, we think, initiate a cascade of events that magnify the effects of stress and lead to interneuron loss in schizophrenia in adults. So in other words, stress, we know, will activate the mesocortical dopamine system. When it activates the mesocortical dopamine system, we get a uh, activation of the medial prefrontal cortex, which then feeds back and inhibits the stress response. But if there's deficits, either in the mesocortical dopaminergic system or in the medial prefrontal cortex, we don't get the self-limiting stress response. Now we get a feedback exacerbation of the stress, which can lead to deficits. Now, are MAM-treated rats more sensitive to stressors as are proposed to occur in schizophrenia? And what we find is that MAM-treated rats seem to be both anxious and to show increased stress responses. So in the elevated plus mix, where you have two open arms and two closed arms, when animals are anxious, they tend to hide in the closed arms. When they're not anxious, they explore all the arms. The MAM rats hide in the closed arms, suggesting that they're anxious. We also find that they tend to show increased response to stressful stimuli. So if you give a rat a minor foot shock, it will start to show vocalizations um, ultrasonically, so above the human hearing range. This is why you never stress a rat in an animal room because what it's doing is signaling to all the other animals that something bad is happening. In the MAM animals, what we find are much greater foot shock induced uh, vocalizations, both in terms of number of calls and duration of calls. And finally, when we look at the amygdala, an area that we know is involved in uh, uh, anxiety responses, what we find in the amygdala is that the, in the MAM animals, the amygdala neurons are firing at a constant high firing rate. So if stress plays a role in the developmental etiology of schizophrenia, this would suggest that an early intervention in susceptible individuals may help to prevent the transition to psychosis. But <clears throat> we tested this in the MAM rat by administering the anti-anxiety agent diazepam peripubertally and then testing the animals as adults. So what we did is to get a dose of diazepam that in the prepubertal rat would normalize behavior in the elevated plus maze, 
and bring amygdala neuron firing back to control levels. We then give diazepam in, in uh, diazepam-laced cookies for 10 days right before puberty in the male rat. We then withdraw it, wait for them to reach adulthood and do our measures. What we find is that the diazepam blunted the loss of parvalbumin interneurons in the hippocampus, prevented the increase in the number of dopaminergic neurons firing, and reversed the increase in amphetamine-induced hyperlocomotion that we see in the MAM rats. Now, this is giving diazepam to, uh, anim to animals that are in the process of developing schizophrenia. Now, obviously, we don't want to start putting diazepam in frosted flakes to prevent children that might get schizophrenia. But is there a non-pharmacological approach? So what we tried is environmental enrichment. What we did is to give them an environmental enrichment by giving them a rich environment with extra animals, things to play with, toys, uh, and things along these lines. And we did this for postnatal day 20 to 40. We then waited for them to reach adulthood and found that this environmental enrichment alone was enough to prevent this transition to a hyperdopaminergic state. So converging evidence from clinical and basic science studies suggests the inability to regulate stress early in life can lead to pathological changes in the hippocampus that may underlie the emergence of schizophrenia in the adult. The fact that MAM can be circumvented suggests that MAM isn't causing, quote, schizophrenia, but instead is in facilitating the impact of environmental factors on disease susceptibility. And in fact, we think the same thing might be happening in humans. 20 years ago, we thought about schizophrenia as being a gene environmental interaction. But as more people have been doing genetic studies, the environment seems to have dropped out. But what we think is that this is looking at the wrong factor, that the genes don't cause schizophrenia. What the genes cause is the increased susceptibility to the environmental stressors that can lead to parvovumin interneuron loss and the emergence of schizophrenia. And this is why even identical twins only show a 50% concordance with schizophrenia, and at least a third of schizophrenia is not genetically linked or not familial. So this suggests that major stress by itself during this critical period could lead to the parvovumin loss, even in normal animals. So what we did is to get normal animals in this case, and during this period where the MAM animals are showing increased stress and anxiety and where diazepam prevents the transition, now we take these normal animals and either expose them to three sessions of restraint stress, daily foot shock stress, or combined foot shock and restraint, and then do our behavior and electrophysiology in the adult animals. What we find is that when we look at parvalbumin interneurons, the animals exposed to the stress so it show a significant decrease in parvobumin interneurons and also in parvobumin interneurons surrounded by, by perineuronal nets. Now, this is important because perineuronal nets are a protective agent around the, the parvobumin interneurons. Early in life, the parvobumin interneurons don't have perineuronal nets. Glutamatergic synapses are being made and broken and rearranged on them. After they reach puberty, you start to get these perineuronal nets that lock in the plasticity, but also uh, prevent them from further damage. So the stress before puberty is critical. Furthermore, this effect persists. So if we look at ventral hippocampal activity, we think is being driven by these parvalbumin interneuron loss. The Peripubertal stress increases hippocampal activity measured one to two weeks after the stress, but it's persistent all the way through early and middle adulthood. So this early stress seems to produce a persistent change in hippocampal activity because of the parvobumin interneuron loss. Now, when we start to look at anxiety, what we find is when we look at restraint stress, foot shock, or combined stress, 
all of these measures tend to increase anxiety. We also find that they tend to increase or interfere with cognition. So if we use a novel object recognition test, where we expose an animal to two identical objects and then replace one with a novel object. A normal animal will spend more time exploring the novel object. Restraint stress doesn't seem to impact this, but foot shock and restraint cause a significant decrease in the discrimination, which means they can't tell the difference between the old and the new object. But interestingly, when we look at amphetamine-induced locomotion, only the combined stressors increase amphetamine-induced locomotion. And whenever we look at dopaminergic neuron firing, we do see an increase, but now the increase is limited to the lateral VTA. Now, this is important for a couple of reasons. One is we don't get a big change in amphetamine-induced locomotion, probably because this is more of a medial VTA phenomenon. But in studies that have been done in schizophrenia patients, what they find are the biggest changes in dopamine indices tend to be in this more associative striatum. The associative striatum interconnects with dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but also gets its input from the lateral VTA. So the medial VTA may be more involved in affect, but the lateral VTA is more involved in these uh, the processes related to stimulus salience and that track with what we see as disruptions in schizophrenia patients. Now, this increase in dopaminergic neuron activity after this peripubital stress, just like the hippocampus, is also persistent. We see it one to two weeks after the stress, five to six weeks after the stress, and nine to 10 weeks after the stress. So this 10 days of stress peripubitally causes a permanent change in the hippocampus and the dopaminergic system. So stress, we think, can cause this loss of parvovimin interneurons through oxidative stress and also by activating the amygdala hippocampal pathway that tends to land on these parvovimin interneurons. This parvovimin loss leads to ventral hippocampal hyperactivity, increased DTA activity, and psychosis. Now, the one thing that puts a break on this is the medial prefrontal cortex, especially the prelimbic prefrontal cortex. This is the area that stress causes an activation of dopamine release, activates the system, and feeds back and inhibits the self-limit the stress response. What happens if there's a dysfunction in the prelimbic prefrontal cortex? Well, what we find is if we lesion the prelimbic prefrontal cortex five days before we give our stressors, what we find is this lesion in the prelimbic prefrontal cortex alone is enough to cause an increase in anxiety, a disruption in cognitive ability, and a selective increase in the lateral VTA dopaminergic neurons firing and uh, amphetamine-induced locomotor response. So now, after the prelimbic prefrontal cortical lesion, foot shock alone is enough to cause this uh, increased anxiety, discrimination, and activation of the lateral VTA, whereas in the control animal, foot shock alone was insufficient to cause these changes. Now, what about stress exposure in adult rats? Well, if we do the same foot shock restraint st stress exposure when the animals are adults and measure them five to six weeks later, there's no change in dopaminergic neuron firing. But interestingly, if we look one to two weeks later, what we see is a decrease in dopaminergic neuron firing. And furthermore, uh, this decrease tends to happen in the medial VTA. This medial VTA is a, the area that projects the ventral medial striatum that's involved in affective responses and is actually what we see in animal models of depression. Now, why are these animals during this uh, critical period so sensitive to stressors? Well, during this critical period, before the paraneuronal nets are formed, when the parvobumin neurons are undergoing a lot of plasticity, 
there are a lot of different processes that are going on. Again, glutamatergic synapses are being made and broken and rearranged. After the critical period, the parvobumin, uh, the perineuronal nets come into place, lock in the plasticity, which is why you're not as plastic after puberty, um, and protect them from further degeneration. But there are interventions that can reopen the critical period. And one of them is a histone deacetylase inhibitor. What we found is that the histone deacetylase inhibitor has been found to reopen the critical periods in areas like the visual cortex, which can restore uh, things like uh, binocular rivalry. But can we make adults more vulnerable by reopening this critical period? Well, what we did is to use valproic acid. And we gave valproic acid starting at postnatal day 60 and then gave this combined stress to the adults at postnatal day 65 to 75. And what we find, and again, in the normal animal without valproic acid, we get a decrease in the number of dopaminergic neurons firing. But when we reopen the critical period, now the same stress increases the number of dopaminergic neurons firing and increases amphetamine-induced locomotor response. And furthermore, this effect persists we see this big increase in uh, dopaminergic uh, neuron activity and amphetamine-induced locomotion, even measured at postnatal day 105 to 115. Now, if we do this and look at the hippocampus, we also see the same thing. The stress causes an activation of the hippocampus, and this hippocampal activation is persistent. So by reopening the critical period in the adult, we can get the same susceptibility that we got in the prepubertal individual. If we look at, par at uh, parvalbumin interneurons, what we see is something interesting. Whenever we look at the stress, what we find is the stress drops parvalbumin interneurons both in normal and BPA rats. But in the, in the normal rats, parvalbumin recovers. In the rats treated with BPA, it doesn't recover. So what we see is a persistent loss in parvalbumin interneurons and parvalbumin interneurons that are surrounded by paraneuronal nets. Now, the thing about valproic acid is it has a number of other effects. It's a GABAergic agent, it's a mood stabilizer. So we decided to use a different compound, SAFA, that's more of a selective uh, uh, HDAC inhibitor. What we found with Saha is it did the same thing. It allowed stress to reintroduce the critical state with Saha in the adult animal. Now, what about the case where there's no additional peripubertal stress or the subject is pr protected from prepubertal anxiety? Now, if you look at evidence from the hum human literature, if you look at patients that are at ultra high risk for schizophrenia, in other words, they're showing attenuated psychotic signs, we know that about a third of those individuals transition to schizophrenia, but two thirds don't. But the two thirds that don't are not normal. They're actually prone to affective disorders like anxiety and depression as adults. Can this also be observed in the rodent model? So what we did is to do this prelimic prefrontal cortical lesion at uh, early postnatal day 31 to 33, but now we didn't give any stress. Remember, we needed at least foot shock stress to get the schizophrenia-like state. So now we're just interfering with the prelimbic prefrontal cortex ability to mitigate effects of stress, but not giving a stressor. And what we find is this adolescent prelimbic prefrontal cortical lesion causes an increased anxiety, in the uh, elevated plus maze in the normal rats. And what we find is that whenever we look at a model of depression, we see changes. Now for this, we wanted to have a fast model of depression. And for this, we used uh, learned helplessness. <clears throat> learned helplessness was something developed by Seligman back in the 50s looking at dogs. Where what you do is put an animal into a two chamber box where there's a dividing area. You then expose the animal to one day of inescapable shock, where there's a light indicating the shock's gonna come on, then they're presented with the shock that they can't escape. We then look at 
several days later, but now we give them an escape route. What we find is that in normal animals, um, a lot of them tend to escape, but half of them fail to escape. In other words, they become helpless. They learn that they can't escape. So even though there's this group present, they can't take it. However, if we give a rapid anti acting antidepressant drug, such as ketamine, it can make the helpless rats into non-helpless rats. What we find with the adolescent prefrontal, pre, prefrontal cortical lesions is that again in the saline rats, about um, more than about 60% are non-helpless, about 40% are helpless. After the prelimbic prefrontal cortical lesion, the vast majority of rats are now showing this learned helplessness model of depression. In terms of escape failure and latency to escape. If we look at dopaminergic population activity, what we find, again, in the saline animals uh, with learned helplessness, there's no difference because there's not a lot of learned helplessness animals. After the prelimbic lesion, we see a decrease in the number of dopaminergic neurons firing. But interestingly, if we break it up into helpless and non-helpless, what we find is independent of pretreatment, the helpless animals both the few in the saline and the large number in the ibotenic acid lesion all show decreases in dopaminergic neuron activity. So there's a decrease in medial dopaminergic neuron population activity in all helpless animals, which is then exacerbated by this prelimbic prefrontal cortical lesion given prepuberally. Now this decrease in dopaminergic neuron activity again, is limited strictly to the medial VTA, the area that projects to the ventral medial striatum. And the ventral medial striatum is the area that we think is more involved in affect and reward. So in depression, what we have is a big decrease in the number of dopaminergic neurons active, which means stimuli that are normally associated with reward that would activate the pedunculo pontine tegmentum which in normal rats would cause a lot of neurons to burst fire, now after chronic stress causes a very small number of neurons to be active. And of course, dopaminergic neurons aren't reward itself, but they're necessary for stimuli to take on rewarding properties. And that's pretty much the definition of anhedonia, the inability to derive pleasure from objects that have normally been associated with rewarding events. Interestingly, whenever we look at this in adult animals, we see absolutely no effect of prelimbic prefrontal cortical lesions in the adult, as far as anxiety, as far as learned helplessness, and as far as dopaminergic neurons firing. So whenever this is done in the adult animal, the animals are given a week to recover, we don't see an effect. The lesion has to be done prepubertally in order to change these parameters. Now, how does peripubertal or prepubertal stress make the system more vulnerable to the adult depression? <clears throat> well, what we find is that adolescent and adult stress causes a transient increase in amygdala activity. So if we give adolescent stress, we get an increase in amygdala activity one to two weeks after the stress, then normalizes by five to six weeks. See the same thing in the adult animal, an increase in, dopam in uh, dopaminergic neuron activity that normalizes after five to six weeks without big changes in firing rate. Now, if we look at what's happening in the different circuitry, so this case, we're looking at the amygdala projections to the prelimbic prefrontal cortex, the area that's involved in these uh, mitigating stress responses. If you do high frequency stimulation in the amygdala, what you find in the adult is long-term depression of the synapse in the prefrontal cortex. And we think this long-term depression is because of the amygdala projections to the interneurons causing 
long-term potentiation on the interneurons and long-term depression in the pyramidal neurons. Prepubertally, the same high-frequency stimulation doesn't cause any change in plasticity. So there's nothing prepubertally, but you do see this, this LTD in the adult. But the animals that are exposed to prepubertal stress, we actually get a precocious development of this uh, hippocamp or amygdala to prefrontal cortex LTD. So it starts to resemble the adult form much earlier in development than it should. So these data suggest that adolescent stress leads to a transient increase in BLA activity. And we think this leads to the precocious maturation of BLA prefrontal cortical inhibitory plasticity. What we propose is that the, the BLA prefrontal cortex isn't supposed to be at the adult state at this early stage because the animal hasn't learned how to deal with the environmental variables. But when it's exposed to early stress, there's a premature maturation of this pathway to enable them to exert some control over this prepubertal stressor. But the consequence is they don't get to take advantage of the learning process that's going to occur before the plasticity is instantiated, which means now there's going to be a disruption in the ability to mitigate stress effects in the adult. So you're trading the ability to, to partially mitigate the effects in the adolescent with disrupting the ability to do it in the adult, leading to increased susceptibility to depression. So what this data is suggesting is that the deleterious impacts of stress combined with factors predisposing an individual to the impact of stress, we think underlies susceptibility to schizophrenia and depression, but it's critically dependent on the timing of the stress. If the exposure occurs during adolescence, when the parvobumin neurons aren't protected, especially if the exposure is extreme or if there's predisposing factors like the uh, interference with prelimbic prefrontal cortex, there's a parvobumin loss and schizophrenia. But if the stress exposure occurs during adulthood, when the parvobumin neurons are protected, you could get depression. And the increased response to stress we think is mediated by a failure of the medial prefrontal cortex to limit the impact of stress exposure. So the medial, the prelimbic prefrontal cortex is involved in limiting the stress exposure, but if it's not working, then you're going to get an increased uh, stress-induced damage. Now what this suggests is that if you can identify susceptible individu individuals and intervene early enough, you might be able to prevent the deleterious impacts of stress and the transition to schizophrenia and potentially alleviate the long-term consequences on adult affective disorders. And um, now, of course, we don't want to, as I mentioned, start putting benzodiazepines in, into frosted flakes, but what we can do is to start mitigating these effects by looking at early social, inter social interactions. For example, we know that social uh, effects during this peripubertal state are critical. Uh, Robin Murray suggested that the number of times a family moves between the ages of 10 and 15 is highly correlated with getting schizophrenia later in life, because every time they move, they have to form all new social bonds, which is extremely stressful. Uh, this is also true of Jamaicans that move to the UK. Jamaicans that move to the UK the adults don't show pathology, but their children, which are now having to go into a already established social system, show a, a seven to tenfold increase in the incidence of schizophrenia. But if you look at uh, the barriers surrounding Sao Paulo, Brazil, very poor areas where there are extended families because they can't afford to move, but there are also high social support networks, you don't get, you see a much lower incidence of major psychiatric disorders. So again, intervening early enough in individuals that are showing uh, hyper-responsivity to stressors might be effective at preventing the transition. And then to thank the people who did this work, especially Holly Moore, who developed the MAM model in my lab, uh, Yi Zhuan Du, who did a lot of the work looking at the diazepam effects, uh, Felipe Gomez and Jason Zhu, who did a lot of the developmental work, 
Dan Lodge and uh, uh, Eric Zimmerman and Tony West and Stan Floresco, who did a lot of the work looking at the circuitry of the system. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'll be glad to answer questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tony. It uh, looks like we've got uh, time for a couple of questions. We've got two in the chat here. So I um, can just read these aloud for everybody to hear. The first one is from uh, Anna Herman, um, who asked regarding the freezing experiment where MAM animals did not freeze in either of the contexts associated with the shock. Uh, haven't you showed in neuropsychopharmacology that contextual or tone fear conditioning is not altered, but only extinction in the tone protocol? Yes, that, that's true, but it has to do with um, exactly when the animals are tested. So in this case, what we're doing is just a freezing experiment um, in, in man animals related to context, not with related to shock. So we're measuring whenever we're putting them into a previously punished context. So as far as shock um, with the uh, contextual tone and fear conditioning, it's not altered, but whenever we do this, uh, these different environments, we do seem to see this change. Excellent. Uh, Stefan Heckers asks a question that I think um, is an important one here. What makes the PV positive interneuron so vulnerable to stress or genetic effects? So the parvobiumin neurons fire in extremely high frequencies. They fire in 40 to 60 hertz, which is really fast for a neuron firing. Um, also, parvalbumin is a uh, protein that sequesters calcium. So the parvalbumin can sequester the calcium in order to prevent it from having its action. And parvalbumin is a very rapid calcium inactivator. So it can help to rapidly inactivate the calcium entry. But what you have is if the parvalbumin either isn't being made in high enough quantities, or if you have an exacerbation of this uh, amygdala to hippocampal drive on the parvalbumin interneurons, it's going to cause them to fire even much faster. And if there aren't paraneuronal nets, you're going to, not going to have the protection of the system, which is going to make these neurons very vulnerable to the de deleterious impacts of stress until the paraneuronal nets form. Excellent, excellent. So it uh, looks like we might have time for uh, just one other question here. Um, Brad Gruder is asking uh, uh, just how extensive is the PV neuron loss and uh, are the remaining PV neurons uh, also altered in some way? So what we see is about a 30% loss of parvalbumin interneurons in the ventral hippocampus, which is roughly equivalent to what's been reported in the anterior hippocampus of humans. Um, and uh, yeah, we might have time for this last question. Jose Zapeta, who uh, is in the Gruder lab, uh, asked about PV neurons in the nucleus accumbens. Are those also affected in patients with schizophrenia? They, there does seem to be an effect in the, um, in the uh, uh, nucleus accumbens, but it's not nearly as severe because they don't get nearly the kind of excitatory input. Uh, that that the ones in the hippocampus get. Gotcha. All right. Well, I think we're out of time here. We'll let uh, everyone go on to the next meeting. But uh, thank you, Tony. We really appreciate your uh, your being here for us, and uh, really enjoyed your lecture. Oh, great! Thanks very much. And right. Thanks for inviting me. Hopefully, oh, I'll right. be there in person next time. That'd be great. Sounds good. All right. Thank Take you. good care. <laughs> Bye -bye. Take care.